I am honored to be with Patrick Bosch, Managing Director of Nagamore in Madrid, Spain. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thanks a lot, Noah. I met Patrick uh, many years ago um, in my travels in Spain. Uh, I knocked on his door because he has a lot of hydromats. Um, and Spain is a beautiful place to visit, and it's a good excuse uh, to go there to look for machines and treasure. Um, so, Patrick, today we're going to talk uh, mainly about machining in Spain um, and your company. And I, I think you have a lot of interesting perspective having been born in Germany, that's my understanding? I myself am born in Madrid, but I'm the, the first Spanish-born generation, so my entire background is German, so that's why also my, my name is more German than Spanish, so Patrick Bosch doesn't really sound very Spanish. Okay, so, okay, so good, I'm glad we got that, that figured out, and, and, um, also, I, you have started a company in Mexico, correct? Yes, indeed. So N Nagamore uh, founded a subsidiary called Nagamex in Mexico. So easy to differentiate when you talk about the uh, plant in Spain or Mexico. So the Mexican is in Nagamex two years ago. And uh, well, the first year was uh, set up shipping of uh, the machine, uh, all the building uh, equipment installation. Yeah. And now, since one year, we are in zero production. Wow. Wow. Okay, so I, I'll touch on that as well. Um, so, okay. First, just I want to give people a quick <clears throat> understanding of Nagamore um, and then um, get a, a little bit about you. Um, maybe the, you know, three to five minute story of your life. And then uh, we're going to talk about um, the machining world in Spain. So first, okay. what, what is Nagamore? What, what do you guys make? What, what's your industry? So Nagamore is a company specialized in turn parts. So we do machining uh, with different types of uh, machining uh, of machines. So we do... Uh, either rotary transfer machines or hydromat machines, as you already mentioned. Then we have this uh, multi-spin lace and finally also CNC lace. So uh, what we do is uh, we do uh, turn parts for the automotive industry. That would be the, uh, the quick uh, story. Sure, sure. Um, and how, how big of a company are you? Hmm. So N Nagamore is, as of today, uh, as big as 150 employees. Uh, and we have a turnover of around uh, 15 million euro. So around 16, 16 17 million uh, dollar a year. And uh, that includes as well our subsidiary in Mexico. Uh, we do have a machine park of around 80 machines, eight zero. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say two thirds of them are uh, turning or general machining uh, uh, machines, so transfer, CNC's, and multi-spindle, and then we have a, uh, a third of the machine park are secondary process machines like grinding, rolling, stamping, uh, heap hole drilling, uh, induction hardening, etc. Okay. And you are the founder of the company, or... Um... Well, the company is a, has a curious start. Uh, the company uh, was founded by a, a Spanish uh, company called Nagares in, as a joint venture together with a, a, Germany, a German called uh, Moore. So that's why this uh, funny name Naga Moore. Uh, but the two partners didn't get along each other just when the company was on paper. So by then, uh, the Spanish partners stepped out and my parents, uh, my family is a German speaking, but Spanish citizen uh, family stepped in. Uh, although a few years later, they also took over uh, the part of the German uh, founder. And uh, as of today, so or just a few years after it was founded, it was already uh, fully owned by our family. 
but our surname is Bosch, so we have not too much aspirations to change the name of the company, <laughs> as you can imagine. So uh, Bosch indeed is our one of our customers. So that's why we just left it as it is, and uh, Nagamor is still here with us uh, today. Twenty six. It would be pretty ago. confusing if all of a sudden you were Bosch. I'm sure yes. that would. Indeed. I see, and. So you um, you have a background in finance. I have a background. Uh, I, I have uh, my initial years uh, were in finance, indeed. So uh, I studied uh, in business administration uh, and engineering. And after university, I started the first uh, six years in the finance industry. So uh, first uh, in uh, the investment banking and then later on the private equity uh, business. And at some point uh, I had the opportunity either to continue that path or to change completely my career and step into the family company, uh, which I finally did. So I'm happy right. to do so uh, since 2011. I'm now uh, part of Nagamore and since uh, 2013, indeed, uh, leading the company. Interesting. Okay, so your family, your family has, uh, you had, your family had businesses or machining business background? What's... Uh, the, they had another company, also machining. Uh, so they have some uh, experience, not, not the same type of machines, so not really turning machines, uh, uh, another division, but also automotive. Uh, so that's well how they got some experience and, uh, and where in the way uh, when the, the company, which was still on paper, was looking for someone else to, to really start the project. Interesting. Okay, I see. Um, okay, well, give me a little bit of a background on you. So your your family is german and then you grew up in spain you were born in spain yes indeed i did um so why did your family move to spain from germany well um i'll i'll answer with the same uh, funny answer that my father does when he's uh, asked this question uh, he came here for the first time 1962 uh, to learn one year Spanish and he said okay uh, I'll keep as long as I need until I can perfectly speak Spanish and here <laughs> he is still uh, improving it <laughs> I like so, it by, by then and it was really something unusual because uh, normally people from Spain were traveling for example to Germany to look for jobs uh, he did it uh, the other way around mm -hmm. and uh, the NT he liked uh, the the life here, the opportunities that he found, and uh, and what. Uh, and is your mom? Fifty years later, here he is. I see. And your mom is Spanish. No, she's German as well, and she moved also to Spain uh, a few year, uh, years later. Very interesting. Um, how often do you go back to Germany, or do you ever go back to Germany? Oh, a few Just times. Just for a business. Year. I mean, for, for business, perhaps two, three times a year. And then I try to connect it uh, with some family visits. Sometimes we have uh, some longer stays where we have uh, family encounters. So uh, at least three, four times a year, uh, I usually go to Germany. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm glad I cleared that up. <clears throat> you know, when I try to place your accent, I, I guess it's a Spanish accent, but I... I don't know. I always pictured, oh, I'm talking to Patrick Bosch. <laughs> this must be a German yes. English <laughs> accent. Um, so you studied engineering. Um, you had a family background in engineering or in manufacturing. Uh, is machining a popular subject in Spain? or manufacturing that that sort it of is, um, world in, in the north of spain it is a quite well-known industry and uh, quite popular i would say uh, in madrid uh, a bit if you go to the south uh, the less <laughs> probably so here in spain we have a, a higher industrialization rate in the north 
areas uh, rather than the southern regions. Uh, but uh, generally, yes, it's uh, it's 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 well, it's of course very well known uh, uh, job, and uh, there are quite many uh, young people doing it. Nowadays, I would say people, when they think of uh, technology, they think more of IT technology or some new technologies rather than machining. Uh, but it is really part of, uh, of the industry here. And uh, in Spain, for example, automotive industries uh, is more than 10% or around 10% of GDP. Okay. So that's a very important uh, industry. Um, with automotive, you have the machining world. Sure. Sure. Um, so yeah, you said the Basque country and, um, and then it's manufacturing and machining is pretty big in, in Catalonia, right? As well, like Barcelona. Exactly. Yes. So Basque country and Catalonia is, are, are the two main regions. So Madrid would be the third one, I would say. And those are the two regions that are always wanting to leave Spain. Yes, indeed. So here we here is Nagamore trying to to cope up. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's something um, I think a lot of people don't know about Spain. Spain is very. My impression, having been there, is it's it's not the most united country among its regions. Um, is that is that true, or am I is is there a like a a Spanish pride among the people i am spanish or is it mainly um you know i'm catalonian i'm i would say I'm castilian half, half, half the of the population are really are proud of being spanish uh, the other half uh, think more regionally perhaps uh, but if you look into the history books i mean spain is a country that exists for more than 300 years now so indeed is one of the oldest countries in uh, in europe uh, despite the fact that there are some regions like the ones you just mentioned that uh, have also their own cultures and having a, an old culture, an own culture can be, is, is a very good thing, uh, but can also sometimes uh, have well, feelings that uh, might not be, uh, well, might not allow you to think as Spain as, a, uh, as one country, but uh, as, a, as a sum of different regions. Yeah. <laughs> But you, getting a, are you, you're not hearing a weird echo from me, are you? No, no, okay, I'm hearing good. you perfectly well. Good. But you, uh, living in Madrid, you're, you know, the capital. You're, you're one of the the people who. You're more. I'm Spanish. This is. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say yes. So is it difficult for you to find skilled workers um, where you are? Everybody is, most, most places I talk to around the world, people are complaining about that. Um, it's hard to find, you know, we, we mentioned before, you said engineering is a pre, you know, it's a well-regarded subject. But as far as people that want to work in a shop, um, you know, from the ground up, is it hard to find people that want to learn or that already have the talent? It's it's not easy. I can uh, I'm in the same opinion that uh, nowadays skilled uh, workers uh, is difficult to find, and usually you don't find them. You really have to uh, to make them learn uh, as they do their job and uh, train them. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, because the machining business is often very unique in every shop has his specific machines, brands, etc., processes. So uh, even if they do have some experience from uh, previous uh, jobs, it might not always be useful on your own, in your own company. Right. Uh, so that's why at the end you, you end up uh, having to train them uh, yourself. I see. Uh, well, you know, it's often better to train them yourself anyways, they say, because then you don't have to make them unlearn something <laughs> yes. else. Exactly. Um, so you said 10% of Spain is automotive. Uh, what, what else is Spain known for as far as manufacturing in general and machining? What, where, what is there, where do you guys shine? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, there's also quite a, uh, now if you think, for example, in, in, in energy or renewable energy, so uh, all the renewable uh, wind uh, um, turbines, for example, there's well-known uh, turbine uh, manufacturers here in, in Spain, Gamesa, for example. Um, then you have, uh, well, other type of businesses, uh, which is uh, not machining itself, but uh, industry in general, so all, all other energy and uh, engineering companies itself. So companies that make engineering projects. Spain is very, uh, very well known worldwide for engineering projects. So, so this is also one of the flagships I would uh, really count in Spain. Mm -hmm. is, is there... Um, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about the unemployment in Spain and how it was, what, 50% of men under 25 were unemployed or I, 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 I need to check the stats. Um, what is it like right now? I, I know it, I'm sure it, everything went haywire with the virus, but um, is unemployment a huge issue in Spain? Like it more is than other uh, European yeah. countries and uh, unemployment in Spain is generally an issue because in Spain you have uh, a lot of short time work uh, empl employ um, employees uh, for example the entire uh, tourism industry uh, so you have the summer months uh, where you have a, a high rate of uh, people working uh, in all the tourist areas restaurants hotels etc and then, of course, uh, the rest of the year, when then this goes down, uh, these people are unemployed. So, type uh, a part of our economical structure uh, makes it structural uh, that we do have uh, a high unemployment rate, um, higher than any other country. So, here, for example, uh, beginning of this year, previous of the pre-crisis, it was, I would say, around 11%. Uh, so, it was going down towards 10. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps um, right now it's again at 18 uh, with, uh, after a few months of, of crisis. So you have a very uh, quick uh, jumps that go up and down uh, very quickly. And yeah. uh, one of the reasons is uh, precisely uh, this economic structure that we, that we have. I see. Tell people about the typical uh, work day of... Uh, a Spanish person, both in the office and in the shop. I mean, it's a bit different, right? I mean, you guys start, mm -hmm. you 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 have a, a siesta in the middle of the day, or uh, how, this is, <laughs> or is that a bunch of BS? The, you you cannot say that we have a siesta. This does never ever happen. <laughs> Hopefully, of course, uh, when you're in summer on vacation, uh, you do a siesta, but not when you're working. Okay. So, uh, and a normal day. I mean, here in Spain, uh, Spain has uh, one difference, uh, and it's uh, quite unique because even neighbor countries like Portugal or France or Italy uh, don't have this. Is that we work uh, like in another, like if we would be in another time zone. So if everyone is waking up at I don't know six in the morning in Spain, you're waking up at uh, seven thirty. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm talking in general. Not uh, there's uh, if you have them, for example, people working on the shop uh, that work uh, three shifts a day. They start at seven. So here, for example, our morning shift starts at seven. And uh, if you go to, to Germany, to give an example, uh, they start at six. Or uh, and then lunch is at uh, noon or twelve thirty. And here it's at uh, I would say two. It's usually the uh, the time two p.m. And same for dinner. So you don't don't go for dinner before I would say eight thirty nine. And uh, there are people in summer that go even at, at ten to have dinner. So it's uh, it's uh, we live like we would be uh, one two hours uh, later than than everyone, and I guess that might be also one of the reasons why uh, we have always this uh, <laughs> uh, prejudgment that in Spain we're late. We're not late. We're just starting later and then ending later. <laughs> right, we are late. Well, that that is interesting. I yeah. So so typically, for instance, you would work until six o'clock then? No, I would come in at 8.30 in the morning mm -hmm. and I would work until, well, I personally perhaps until late in, in the evening. Eight? And yeah, well, people in the office perhaps until until seven. So 
it's uh, it's it's long times. It's, uh, I mean, if you don't have dinner until until nine, leaving at uh, seven is the same as if you leave at at five and then have dinner at uh, at seven p.m. I suppose. Um, and then, what time would you go to bed? Uh, I would say midnight is usually the, the the time. Yeah. I I. Oh man, seven o'clock being at the office on a daily basis. That seems, I understand you're starting slightly later, but mm -hmm. I just would feel like all my daylight is gone. You know, you're like and getting home and. That's true. I mean, uh, that's also why here in Spain, uh, we're the country within Europe. So within the time zone of uh, central European time, which is most uh, west of all of the entire Europe. Uh, so here the sun goes down perhaps one hour later than in, uh, in Central Europe or two hours later in Eastern Europe. So there you already have these two hours difference that I'm talking about. Hmm. Here the sun doesn't go up uh, in, in winter until 8.30. So it's, it's dark when you're driving into the office at uh, 8 in the morning. Yeah, Ugh. I can't. I don't even want to think about winter. Um, yeah. <laughs> What what is a normal um, somebody in the shop um, or at a machining company? What what is the range of salaries? I know that that the the price of living is a little different, but it's not that different. I mean, from Spain and the United States, I think. Mm -hmm. It varies. I mean, in, in Spain, you have people that, uh, I mean, if you hire someone that has no experience at all, uh, you might start at, uh, I would say, $21,000 a year. So how, salary, many year uh, how many euros? 20,000 euros a year. Okay. 18 to 20, but uh, this is just, so just the salary, basic salary. So no extras or and no social security. In the U.S., you don't know uh, about Social Security as, as we do. And in Spain, for example, you need to add 33% uh, uh, of the salary uh, of the people. So if someone has a salary of 21,000, for example, you're paying 28. Okay, okay. So you need and to pay the 7,000 extra to, to the government. Sure. And is that, co is that covering health insurance? Exactly. So that, that's how you cover health, mainly health and then uh, pensions. Okay. And uh, unemployment. And unemployment. Um, <laughs> I've heard that the health insurance in Spain is really good. Is this, uh, is this true? It is. Yes, it is. I mean, here, there are people who can afford it who usually have also a private insurance and then they can choose. But whenever you have something which is really serious, Mm -hmm. Although you have the the opportunity to go to the private doctor, you go. You end up always going to the public. Really? Yes, always. I mean, I'm assuming you have both. So yes, and uh, and I usually only go to the public one because it's just perfect. I always ask myself, why do I have the uh, the private one? Just in case for a second opinion. <laughs> exactly. So, just in case something happens. Uh, I would, uh, well, pull, pull myself from the hair. Uh, if something happens, then I wouldn't have it if I can afford it. But it's not like in, uh, in the US. I mean, here it's much more affordable. I mean, here the ground. And in, in my age, you might, have, you might have to pay, I don't know, six, 700 euros a, a year. So 60, 70 uh, a month. So it's, it's, it's really not too much. But you feel like if you have the public health insurance, you're going to get all the care you need, all the drugs you need, really good doctors. You're not yes. going to be waiting in long lines. Like you only think have to wait. If you, if you have something which is not serious, then you have to wait. If you have something serious, then you are really taken care of. Fair enough. Well, yeah. that would be nice to have here. Um, what is something about Spain that people around the world just wouldn't expect? Um, in Spain, people work much harder than uh, our reputation uh, is. I would say this is something that uh, uh, you can really say uh, from Spanish people. 
Very interesting. Um, okay, this brings me to uh, to Mexico a bit. Um, I, we could probably have a whole other interview about Mexico. Uh, <laughs> tell me about a little bit about what you guys are doing down there and why you started it in Mexico. Yeah. So the, the Mexico so Nagamex, uh, the, the project itself, it's uh, it's something that started uh, in our brains already 2015. So we got uh, uh, during two years, uh, two of our main customers knocking on the door, asking us why wouldn't you uh, evaluate the possibility of uh, opening a, a shop there, so that you can be a, a local supplier to our uh, Mexican or, or North American uh, plants. And after two years of hearing the same message, uh, at some point we decided, well, let's let's go to Mexico. Let's have a first uh, feeling on uh, on the floor how it is like uh, there. Uh, we we visited. So you were exporting parks. a lot. You were exporting a lot to Mexico and the U.S. already. Uh, our customers, so automotive and mainly uh, big and, uh, international companies, but uh, of European uh, origin, mm -hmm. uh, they usually in Mexico and North America buy a lot of turn parts either from European suppliers or from Asian suppliers. Okay. But there's quite a gap in the in the North American market. So that's how well that's that's uh, why they were pushing so strongly to have something as uh, someone local there because at the end uh, uh, they always go for the most competitive one or the one with the best quality. But as soon as you are in similar ranges, uh, the region for region uh, policy is what really at the end counts. So uh, that's uh, why they were pushing us to to evaluate this and uh, well after. Uh, another year of uh, thinking about it and business plan drawings, etc. We decided to go for it. And and I mean, it's I guess it's hard to evaluate it because of certain things that have come up. But uh, how how is it going? Is it is have there been a lot of unexpected challenges? Um, a lot of unexpected things you've encountered aside from COVID. Mm -hmm. in, in general, I think um, we have encountered uh, the, the, the main uh, topics that you hear about Mexico, uh, namely a lot of paperwork uh, with the administ public administration. So this is something that is really generally uh, well, uh, resource taking, let me say it this way. Um, and then also, well, you have some uh, employee turnaround. So uh, you have some very good employees, and then you have some others which will really go there. And uh, after one month, you don't you don't even know the name again because it's the third guy in the same position. So it's uh, in, in Mexico, you have a bit of everything, um, but the ones uh, which stay and are loyal, they these are very very uh, good people. And uh, well, for for our. Uh, so something I have to say for Mexico, until now, so two years uh, we are now in Mexico, we have not uh, been approached for any type of corruption or nothing like that. So this is something uh, positive and also a, a prejudgment uh, generally for Mexico. And I think the automotive industry there is uh, very well established and uh, SUR in a very well established and professionalized uh, business area. Uh, you don't Where, what area are you in? What city? Querétaro. Oh, Querétaro. Yeah, it's in the center of the country in a, in a region called El Bajío. Okay, and it, that's sort of a resort area? or a... Oh, no, no, no resort. It's, it's an industrial area. Querétaro, but, no? Querétaro itself is also very uh, beautiful, historic. Uh, but it's uh, not where people go on vacation. Usually, somebody no. was trying to Somebody was trying to get me down there to look at some machines, and they said, oh, it, people go on vacation over here. Uh, it, it's true that uh, Querétaro and also San Miguel Allende, which is just 40 minutes from it, uh, are two very beautiful colonial uh, uh, cities. So it's uh, really worth it to visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, but people, I mean, tourists mostly go to to the beach in, in Mexico. Sure. And it Mexico seemed like a good fit. I'm assuming because of the language. Yes, or... indeed. Is uh, well was one of the main uh, drivers. Uh, when we got approached, uh, of course, uh, uh, well, 
instead of Mexico, why not Asia, for example? And Asia yeah. is a bit bigger market than in, uh, in North America. But at the end there, the, the cultural difference is even stronger and the language barrier is uh, absolutely equal. I think you can uh, work there with a, a translator the entire life before you learn Chinese or, or any language they speak there. No, it's totally true. I could see that. And the cultural differences, yeah, they, I, it must make it much more smooth. Um, but where do you see uh, Nagamore in the next, um, next year as far as the challenges? Do you see business is going to be pretty good? Mm -hmm. Well, now with the Corona crisis, uh, so we had a few months uh, where everything really uh, well, turned down and was very, very uh, well, slow and calm. And we see now that the, after summer, it seems that uh, everyone is going crazy again and uh, not sure where and how they're going to sell as many cars as we're producing <laughs> parts for. Uh, truth is that I think that the, probably the pipeline of the supply chain is, is filling up. So that's why we have a a peak in demand now in uh, in September October, and then uh, from from November onwards, we'll probably see the the real structural demand that will stay after the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure if uh, this will change if uh, there's a vaccine on the way and people then will uh, go crazy because we can again party, uh, and suddenly economy grows and in our case, uh, automotive market uh, grows with it. Maybe the case, but uh, I would say for the first, uh, as a first uh, answer, for a few months of uh, strong recovery, and then we'll see yeah. it stabilize. Well, you, your business is what, like a ninety percent automotive or ninety nine. So ninety nine. So when COVID hit, how much was it down? Fifty percent. Seventy percent. So we were indeed uh, for two months uh, having a turnover of twenty eight, twenty nine percent of a. Uh, pre-COVID uh, month. Wow. So we're, we're, we're strongly, very strongly, yes. Wow. Um, what's, what is uh, something interesting you learned last week? Hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> oh, what did I learn last week? It doesn't have to be that profound. It could just be like, look, I saw this movie about race car and whatever i mean it, it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. i just saw a movie last weekend about a, the a formula one racer I, that's why i brought that up i'm just saying it doesn't have to be that that deep no. if it's deep that's good though yeah i yeah, no, 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 <laughs> not, not, not that deep but it, it, indeed i i saw uh two weeks ago indeed uh, on a weekend uh, i i saw uh, someone on a bicycle on the water so just Whoa. Uh, top, top that <laughs> well were they were they being pulled by a boat or no 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 you're they're really doing it uh, and when they were they were paddling and the the wheels uh, underneath the water and, uh, they were moving forward with, like a paddle boat so the wheels were, were... Very, very difficult to imagine uh, until you see it because so I, the I, wheels, but the wheels were special, right? They had like certain yes, yes, of course, mm -hmm. blades yes. on them, or it's it's not like like round wheels as you can imagine uh, them, but uh, you were uh, the guys were just moving like if they were on the bicycle because everything was a bicycle, uh, but then they weren't floating on a device. You didn't see what was under the water, and they were just uh, well, everyone was uh, looking at them and uh, just going crazy. Uh, to to see what was uh, uh, how they were doing this that is so cool i want to see that i'm going to look it up on youtube or something um and uh just before we finish up is there anything else you'd like to say to the people of the world well courage corona crisis will soon be ended it's mostly in our minds uh, if we take seriously uh, all the health measures and uh, confidence only comes if uh, uh, all ourselves are uh, confident uh, and show us confident to, to the rest of the world. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. Really, this, this was great.